Hello, BookTube. It's Monday, and what better way to start off a week than by looking at some new books together? <laughs> I've already had a very, very bookish day uh, today, even before this. I've got some mail packages here we'll go through, uh, and that's a very nice feeling. It's very nice, and it's also distracting, which is also nice. <laughs> uh, so th we've got a few packages here, uh, and it ends in a box, and it's not just a box, it's a very heavy box. I think it's probably going to be a finished copy of something really big, which could please Steve greatly. Uh, so let's see here. Okay, this first one is from Harvard University Press. It's due in early July. Any day now. Oh, any day now I have to move. I have to do the grand shift. I have to move all of my move out all of my June books that haven't been reviewed and move up. July, and then move up August, and then move up everything else. And then I have to organize July. Left to right being ascending date of publication. So the stack on the left-hand side will be the first week of July, then a stack for the second, then a stack for the third, and so on. Uh, you know, it, would be, it wouldn't be so uh, tedious and heartbreaking a task. It's tedious because it's manual labor. <laughs> That's what God made muscular teenagers for. And it's heartbreaking because... It, not only the moving of the June books, but also the sorting of the July books makes me realize that I'm not going to review everything that I have. And all books deserve it. In one way or another, they all do. They're, they all represent a huge amount of work on the part of the author and the publisher. Uh, so that's a little heartbreaking. The only thing that would that would be solace would be if I had the technical con, uh, capability to do one of those time-lapse things where I show you the change uh, as I do it, but... I know. Uh, so anyway, uh, so what is this first one? Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, Haunted by Chaos. It's a book about China's grand strategy for the last uh, 50 years, and it's by Sulman Wasif Khan, which I will call Sulman Wasif Khan, uh, who is an assistant professor of international history and Chinese foreign relations at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Um, before the Chinese Communist Party came to power, China lay broken and fragmented. Today it is a force on the global scale, and yet its leaders have continued to be haunted by the past. Drawing on an array of sources, Sulman Wasif Khan chronicles the grand strategies that have sought not only to protect China from aggression, but also to ensure it would never again experience the powerlessness of the late Republican era. Okay, a variety of sources. So... This is a finished copy. This gives us a luxury of uh, taking a look at what those are. If we look at the bibliography, I, oh, goodness gracious, <laughs> Suleiman Wasif Khan is very young. Uh, but, of course, when it, on a book like this, the first thing I want to know is, does his bibliography include any Chinese sources? Can he read Chinese? Uh, so let's see. <laughs> let's see if we can fill it, figure that out fairly quickly. No. No, it doesn't look like there are any Chinese sources in here. Uh, okay, do you have maybe a note on sources? Oh, no. Okay. No, he does. He does have Chinese sources in here. Good. Good. And they're amply represented. Good. Excellent. All right. Uh, all right, so Chinese... Uh, the Chinese National... I have no viewers in China. Do I? I know I have one, uh, but I don't think I have any others. Well, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Where, let's move on from there. Let's see what this next one is. Uh, okay, this is from Grove Atlantic. Comes out in October. It's by Purumal Purumal Murugan. It's one part woman. Purumal Murugan's one part woman has become a cult phenomenon, selling over 100,000 copies in India, where it was published first in the original Tamil, and then in a celebrated translation by Penguin India. This critically lauded novel has captured Indian readers and jump-started conversations about caste and female employment or empowerment. After experiencing harsh backlash from leaders in his home state of Tamil Nadu and censorship from his frank depictions of small-town life, Murugan has won a landmark court case defending the rights of the artists. Set in South India during the British colonial period, but with powerful resonance in the present day, one part woman tells the story of a couple, Kali and Pona, who are unable to conceive, much to the concern of their families, 
and the crowning amusement of Callie's male friends. Callie and Pona try everything to have a child, including making offerings at different temples, atoning for past misdeeds of dead family members, and even circumambulating a mountain supposed to cure barren women, but all to no avail. A more radical plan is required, and the annual chariot festival, a, cere a celebration uh, of the god Madhurubhagan, who is one part woman, one part man, may provide the answer. On the 18th night of the festival, the festivities culminate in a carnival, and on that night the rules of marriage are relaxed and consensual sex between unmarried men and women is overlooked, for all men are considered gods. The festival may be the solution to Kali and Pano's problem, but it soon threatens to drive the couple apart as much as to bring them together, one would think. <laughs> okay, so the author wrote this originally in Tamil, and it was part of a, of a furor that I uh, was unaware of. And now it has an English language translation. Interesting. Oh, that is interesting. Okay. Uh, all right, so it comes out in early October. I won't read it until the end of the summer. But uh, but I can certainly read up on it in that time. Uh, all right, let's see what's next here. We got oh, great. Fantastic. Oh, wonderful. Okay, this is out already, I think. Yeah, this is out already, and I've already praised it on this channel. It, uh, this is just a second copy. This is the, uh, the Overlook, uh, gorgeous Overlook 50th anniversary reprint of True Grit by Charles Portis with the, uh, the deckled edges and the French flaps. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous reprint. How wonderful. Uh, all right, uh, let's see here. I reread it. The other, the first copy that I got of it, I reread it in one gulp, just one gulp, <laughs> just and loved it and noticed things that I hadn't noticed before. Uh, huh. <laughs> oh, oh goodness! Okay, all right. Uh, this is due in early July. This is a debut work of fiction. This is uh, uh, it's called Early Work by Andrew Martin, and the uh, pub sheet now comes with a large number of blurbs. Uh, Ariana Rebellini from BuzzFeed says to ignore Andrew Martin's early work, a wry and pitch-perfect novel about late 20th-something writers and lazy, progressive creatives in varying stages of existential crises. <laughs> That's a fairly accurate description. Because of any painful familiarity is to do yourself a disservice. <laughs> uh, Julia Pierpont. Uh, author of Among the Ten Thousand Things and The Little Book of Feminist Saints, says, beautifully ex executed and very funny. Sam Lutzite, uh, the author of The Fun Parts and The Ask, a very, very good novel called The Ask, says, what a debut! Early work is one of the wittiest, wisest, sometimes silliest, in the best sense, and bravest novels about wrestling with the early stages of life and love, of creative and destructive urges I've read in a while. The angst of the young and reasonably comfortable isn't always pretty, but Andrew Martin possesses a prose magic to make it hilarious, illuminating, and moving. Uh, okay, and David Gates, the author of Jernigan, says, The people in Andrew Martin's early work, that's this, uh, have it all. Youth, intelligence, ready wit, readier irony, terminally knowing tastes in books and music, affordable rents, abundant, abusable substances, prolific sexual lives, even endearing dogs. And it's perversely exhilarating to watch them, despite their fits of good-heartedness, turn a bucolic bohemia into a hipster hellscape. This is one smart, funny, scary novel. <laughs> and uh, Chris Batchelder, the author of uh, The Throwback Special, says, From a simple boy-meets-girl premise, and from the most basic dramatic ingredients, ardor, art, alcohol, anxiety, Andrew Martin has concocted an exceptionally funny and disturbing first novel. I found myself thinking of Goodbye Columbus and the Mysteries of Pittsburgh. From its title and its opening sentence on, early work achieves the feel of a classic debut. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, they don't even, uh, the pub sheet doesn't even uh, summarize the book. It just gives you this stellar cavalcade of blurbs uh, of a debut work of fiction. And since we have a finished copy, we're finally able to see what the author looks like. What does this Andrew Martin person look like, I wonder? That is what Andrew Martin looks like. <laughs> well, okay. A promising work of fiction. <laughs> uh, and then well, let's, let's move on, if we can, from such heady blurbs. <laughs> let's see what else we have here. 
Oh my goodness. Okay. All right. This uh, this comes out in late September. This is uh, by Micah Goodman, and it is Catch 67, The Right, the Left, and the Legacy of the Six-Day War. Goodness gracious. Since the Six-Day War in 1967, Israelis have been entrenched in a national debate over whether to keep the land they conquered or return some, if not all, to the Palestinians. Uh, in 2017, best-selling Israeli author Micah Goodman published one of Israel's most debated books of the year. Publicly discussed by the heads of all major parties, as well as by Israel's leading opinion makers, Catch 67 topped Israeli bestseller lists. On September 18, 2018, Catch 67 will be published in the U.S. With a new preface by the author written for the English edition, this controversial book sheds light on the ideas that shaped Israel's thinking on both sides of the debate. Okay. All right. So this was a hit in Israel. And now comes to America. All right. Uh, well, as I've mentioned on this channel before, the subject endlessly fascinates me, so I will certainly read it. Uh, and then we come to the box. It's heavy. Uh, who knows how much art and ardor and anxiety and alcohol it will contain. Oh, what have we... Oh, oh my. Oh, oh my. Okay. This comes out right away on 1st of July. And look at how pretty it is. Oh, my. Oh, this is uh, the Oxford Companion to the Brontes. <laughs> look at that. Oh. Huh. So it has everything. It's all, it's all alphabetical, but it also has uh, long uh, offset essays on all kinds of topics. It's a feast for Bronte lovers, just a, a feast. Oh, as well as, look at that, in the beginning there's a detailed chronology. Oh, fantastic. This just goes, uh, it just goes right into the permanent collection. Fantastic. How wonderful. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Great. So we have uh, the Oxford Companion to the Brontes. A beautiful, beautiful finished copy. You diehard Bronte fans out there, on July the 1st, you'd be able to go to your bookstore and get this. And uh, it's probably expensive. Yeah, it's $40 US. Uh, but you'll be using it for the rest of your life. So, uh, And then Catch 67, uh, an Israeli hit. Uh, those of you who are in Israel, maybe uh, tell me a little about the reception of this book, the, whether people have talked about it. Then Early Work by uh, an author named Andrew Martin. <laughs> perhaps a promising young artist. Uh, then True Grit by Charles Portis. Uh, One Part Woman by Paramount Mercury. So we've got, we've got two uh, hits in foreign countries that are coming to America now fairly quickly in translation. I, I find that encouraging. Uh, and of course, it, 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 uh, it satisfies the snoop in me, <laughs> as I would want to know about these things. And last, uh, Haunted by Chaos by Sulman Wasif Khan, uh, about the China's reinvention of its own destiny and self-image and whatnot. So not a bad mail haul to, to start off the week. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap this up for now, but we've got plenty else to talk about. So I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.